Hi, Pastor Anthony here. At Vintage Faith Church, we stand behind the Bible's claim to be the Word of God, and we believe that the Scriptures contain everything needed for life and godliness. The Scriptures testify to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We pray that this recording stirs your faith towards that end. This is in no way meant to be a substitute for the local church gathering, which we believe is critical to your growth as a Christian and your walk with Christ. We pray that you will find the sermon edifying and challenging. Thank you for listening. Well, good morning. And uh, as you know, we, we are weeks into our sermon series on Ephesians. And uh, if, if you've been with us, you know the last five, six weeks, uh, it's been very individual. Paul's been talking about salvation, um, what happens, how the Father, the Son, and the Spirit work in the salvation of, of, of individual people. Um, but for the next four to five weeks, he actually is going to pivot, and he's going to look at how our salvation is corporate. And what I mean by corporate is not um, how we typically use the word corporate, it's, it's a family. That salvation is always saved into something, and we're going to look at the history behind why Paul is saying what he is saying here. And again, we're going to have a good five weeks, um, because this is what Paul does. He's going to spend it on, uh, on the church. He's going to talk about the beauty of the church for five weeks, the plan of God in the church, this thing that we do on Sundays, he's going to um, talk about that and the mystery that, that is the church. Uh, I'm going to read a quote that, that we've already heard, but I, I want to kind of get this out there and be thinking about it. It's Jonathan Lehman, and he says, if you are a Christian living in the Western democracy, Chances are you need to change the way that you think about your church and how you, you are connected to it. Most likely you underestimate your church. You belittle it. You misshape it in a way that misshapes your Christianity. So we're, we're going to look at this, and this is not to, to throw darts. It's just we live in the West, and we, we've all been discipled in the Western individualistic, some would call it radical individualism, where it's me and Jesus and I don't need anyone else, we, we've absorbed that. Just whether we wanted to or not, it's, we, we live in the culture, we can't help it. Um, and we're going to look here, Ephesians, I think Paul's going to just re really tear down any thoughts that we can have, that we can have our faith with just um, us and, and at home and, and me and Jesus, that there is something to the corporate assembly and being um, active in the life of the church. Um, so that, that is what we're going to be looking at for four to five to maybe even six weeks. So we're going to look at the roots of the church. We're going to look at that today. The roots of the church. Where does this thing come from? The new humanity in the church is going to be next week, and the following week is going to be what is the church built on, the foundation of the church. And these are all going to be helpful correctives to all of us in some way. Um, actually, as, as I think about this question, um, what is the church? I know that there's people in here with all different church backgrounds. And we really, when we ask that question, what is the church, there's all sorts of things that, that are clouding our true understanding of what it is. Um, we bring baggage to the table, right? We all do. We have all sorts of ch church backgrounds. Let me name a few. You've got megachurch background. So Protestant megachurch, some of you have been in those churches. They're going to have lots of programs, lots of names for programs. You've got Upward Basketball, Outward, Inward, Mom's, Mom's Night, um, David's Mighty Men. Some of these things might ring a bell. And that's not bad. I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying that might be, when you hear church, where your mind goes. And I know others in here were raised Catholic. So there's that kind of church. That's your smells, your bells, your, your reverence, um, you know, beautiful big buildings, priests. You've got a new type of church that, that emerged and is already kind of dying. It's the rock concert church. 
And that, 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 and, and we laugh, but that's a thing. Like, church should look like a rock concert. Put the lights down really low, crank the music, music up, and we're just going to sing. And man, we don't really need a sermon. Let's just keep singing. That type of church is emerged in the last maybe 20, 30 years, and it's already beginning to, to see the end of its life. And then, of course, we have the culture tells us what church should be like. Um, if you were to go back 30 years, the culture would say, hey, it's a place where people go to um, really just practice their morality. Um, that's changing now. Um, as a pastor, I can tell you that, that the cultural definition of what I do is constantly intruding on me. Um, people who are not in the church think that you, um, me, the pastor, should be something um, that the Bible does not uh, call us to in any way, shape, or form. I should be present with a box of tissues um, at a funeral, and that's not bad. I'm not saying, you know, I, we should, but they have no category for what a, a shepherd in the Bible does, which is preach and proclaim the word of God, to, to preach against false teaching, to, to hold the gospel up here, exalt Jesus. That's not a category the culture has for a pastor. It's not a category the culture has for a church. But I want to impress upon you guys today and all of us at Vintage Faith Church that when you think about church, I want you to see that we are connected to the people of God that goes back all the way to the Garden of Eden. That there is a, however you want to slice it, um, as far as years, well, let's just say 6,000 year history that we have with the people of God. The church is not a new thing. It's new in a way, and we're going to look at that. It is new in a way, but the people of God have always existed. They've always worshipped. They've always gathered together like we are doing. So um, when we think about the church, let's all try to forget about our experiences with church. And in the next four to, to six weeks, let's see what the Bible says about what the church is. I've got a quote here from um, a theologian about church that might be, this might be new to, to some of you. Since Jesus Christ is himself the new Israel... All those united to him by faith are also incorporated into the Israel of God. He is the true vine, the classic Old Testament image for Israel, and we are his branches. Because Christ is the living cornerstone of God's house, those who are joined to him become living stones in that house and can be described by the same terminology that described Israel in the Old Testament. In Christ, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And some of you that were here with us when we preached through 1 Peter, you remember this. This is from 1 Peter, and we're going to have another verse today that's in that light. The text we're looking at today, Paul is going to direct his attention to Gentile Christians. The church of Ephesus was made up of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. The early church was made up of Jewish and Gentile. They, we're going to see next week how they become one in the church. But Paul kind of takes his eyes off the Jews who had converted and believed, and he puts them on the Gentiles today. And if you don't know what a Gentile is, a Gentile is simply anybody that's not a Jew. So I'm going to assume that we're all Gentiles in this room. Um, but in the early church, you had Jews and Gentiles. So Paul is going to direct his attention to the Gentile believers. And what he's going to do today is he's going to tell them, you were on the outside of Israel, you are now in the covenants and, and the promises and, and, and the beauty and the worship that you were on the outside of, that you could not get in on the inside of, you are now in that. You have the rich history of the people of God. Um, and again, I, I realize for some this might be 
um, something that maybe you haven't heard. But, but again, I want to uh, just put this question out. Have you considered how old and rich and deep the heritage of the church actually is? Not only does it go back 2,000 years, it keeps going back. It keeps going back. We stand in the traditions of the people of God. The church didn't just come out of nowhere. This is God's plan from eternity. We worship today the same God that spoke to Moses, the same God that called Abraham, the same God that walked with Adam and Eve, the same God that filled the temple with his glory when Solomon dedicated the temple. We stand here today and we hear from and sing to that same God. Not a different God, the same God. Praise God that we stand in a rich heritage. Okay, let's go into our text today, Ephesians. We're going to look at verses 11 and 12. In chapter 2, therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So first, we're just going to look at this Gentile. Um, Paul calls them Gentiles, and he calls them the uncircumcision. This is a derogatory term that the Jewish people called the Gentiles. Jewish people, circumcision was a sign. It was from the Abrahamic covenant, and it continued All their boys were circumcised. If you don't know what circumcision is, you can ask me after. (laughs) I'm not going to get into the technical parts of that now. But but, uh, so the boys were circumcised. And and all the the Jews called the Gentiles. They're, They're uncircumcised dogs. Actually, some say that the, the, the word for uncircumcision would be foreskin. A derogatory term. And Paul is recalling that here, saying, you Gentiles, you were called this name he's by what is the circumcision, and then he calls out here, which is made in the flesh by hands. So Paul's basically saying here, that there's nothing to this circumcision that they boast about, and we know this from his other writings, but we're not going there. So Paul is addressing the Gentiles And you've heard me over the last few weeks talk about there's one command in Ephesians 1 to 3. One command. Anyone want to take a guess what that is? Remember. This is it. We're in it. I've been talking about it for a few weeks. We're here. This is so all of, of Paul's language in Ephesians 1 through 3 is what God has done for us. It's kind of like sit back and just listen. God is full of grace. He loves you. He's poured out all this love on you. He's redeemed you. He's chosen you. He's adopted you. But now he gets to his first command, and it's simply to remember. There are 33 imperative verbs commands in Ephesians. 33. They all, they start in chapter 4 and they go through chapter 6. But in chapter 1 to 3, this is it. This is the one. And he tells the Gentiles to remember where they came from. I think as Christians, many of us bypass This idea here, we saw the the same thing last week when Paul said you were dead. You were dead in your transgressions, dead in your sins, and God made you alive. It's He's always God in the Bible is always going to give you where you were in darkness and then tell you where 
he has brought you to. And I would submit to you that our level of joy and our level of worship in the Christian faith is directly related to our remembering where we were and what we deserved where we were. And some of you, um, you've been Christian since you were little, and it's hard to remember that. But others of you had a conversion experience in your adulthood, and you, you clearly have, this is where I was, and this is where I am today. But again, I, I want to press on you to not, to not bypass or short-circuit going to where you were. Because there's joy in doing so. In fact, Jesus does this in Luke 7, 47. We have the woman of the city. She comes in to the party and she is weeping and washing Jesus' feet. And the Pharisees are like, Jesus, what are you letting that woman? If you knew who she was, she's a sinner. You would not let her touch you. And Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And Jesus is by no means saying here that those who have sinned the most have the most love. He's putting, shining the, the light upon this idea that when we can see our sin and see how it offends a holy God, we are going to love Christ much. And I say this often, that if you're having a problem in worship and maybe your, 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 your Christianity is feeling like, ah, I'm just kind of going through the motions, I would tell you to go there. Remember, remember where you were. Scott Hubbard says this, of, of this idea, it is a settled spiritual principle it's small thoughts of sin lead to small thoughts of Christ. If we think we have been forgiven little, we, love, we will love little. The same principle applies, however, to those who have simply forgotten how much they've been forgiven. That's, met, that's us on any given day, right? And to one degree or another, we are all prone to forget. Remember. Again, we can't let this pass by us. One imperative verb in all of the first half of Ephesians telling us to remember when we were separated from Christ. When we had no hope, remember. And this is often, you're going to hear this throughout the Bible. If you use a Bible tool like Bible Gateway, just go into Bible Gateway and just type in remember and see how many times that word comes up in the Old Testament and the New Deuteronomy 15, 15. This is a refrain that you hear all throughout the Old Testament. God saying, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you, therefore I command you this today. Multiple times before God gives a command in the Old Testament, he tells the Israelites, remember you were a slave. You were under oppression. You had no hope. You couldn't worship. There was no temple. You had nothing. Remember and remember that God has redeemed you. There's a quote from Desiring God about this idea. When those in Christ heed Paul's command to remember and allow our sin to overshadow us, we arrive at a place we do not expect, not outside of Eden, with cherubim guarding the entrance, not beside the lake of fire, with the flames threatening judgment, but rather beneath the storm clouds of Calvary, where, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we could not escape our depravity, while we could not win God's approval, while we could not avoid condemnation, the Son of God spilt his precious blood, remembering our sin in this way, far from sending us into despair, 
deepens our assurance. Brothers and sisters, that's why Paul is saying, remember, remember. Don't be afraid to remember. Is this part of your spiritual rhythm? Do you often go back and say, I once was this, and now God has come into my life, and I, I, I can see what has happened. I can see the fruit. Amy and I um, often do this. We, in fact, reflect on our marriage, and, and we both have come to the conclusion that we wouldn't be married today if it wasn't for God. We'd be divorced. I would have followed my flesh. She would have followed her flesh. And many other things. Many other things. So do you have remembering as part of your spiritual discipline or rhythm? All right, let's, let's read that verse again. Ephesians 2.12. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. We're going to look at each one of these. Um, First, separated from Christ. It, It all starts there. If you remember the last few weeks, we looked at how many times did it say in Christ, that all the blessings that we have are because we are united to Christ. Eleven times, I think, ten to eleven times in in chapter one, in Christ. Everything is because we're in Christ. God has his blessing on his son, and because we are united to his son, we have the blessing as well. John Calvin says this of of, of our being united to Christ. We must understand that as long as Christ remains outside of us and we are separated from him, all that he has suffered and done for the salvation of the human race remains useless and is of no value to us. If you are not united to Christ by faith, You don't have Christ. You don't have the blessings. You don't have the covenants. You don't have the promises. And you don't have hope. So it all begins with faith in Christ. And if you're in here and and you're kind of waffling and like, well, I don't quite know if I believe and, and I've heard this before, pray to God and ask that he show you who his son is. Jesus Christ, the son of God, has come to save sinners and give them eternal life and hope. All right, so he says, remember that you were separated from Christ. And then he goes on to, this is going to be an interesting part, maybe for some of you. He says, you were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants. So here we have in Ephesians, a church with Jew and Gentiles. He's talking to the Gentiles and he's saying, you were, se- you were separated from Jesus, therefore you didn't have any part in the commonwealth of Israel. We're going to see here at, at the end of Ephesians 2 where Paul, his whole point is now your part. Now you're part of that. But what is it? mean to be alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants? Well, first of all, this is how God was working in the Old Testament. You had the Jews, you had Israel, which was a theocracy, very different than the church. And you had everyone else lost. And he put Israel right on this little strip of land in the Middle East. It was actually the center of the universe. And people had to travel through. And it was intentional. Because Yahweh was worshipped in Israel. The true God was shown who the true God was in Israel. And the Gentiles were alienated. In fact, they couldn't even go to parts 
of the temple. They were treated as dogs. Paul says you were alienated from this. You were strangers to the covenants of promise. So what does this mean? Well, it means they had no scriptures. The Gentiles had no scriptures. They had no hope of a Messiah. No hope. They had no understanding of why the world was like the world was. They did not have the pure worship of the one true God. They had no fellowship with other believers. They had no anchor for the soul in times of trouble and distress. They were blown around by every wind of teaching and anything that they've heard in their flesh, in their emotions. They had no hope of the resurrection, no hope of eternal life. They were lost. And the Israelites had all of this. In fact, Paul says in Romans 9, they are, they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So the Israelites had God. Now, they didn't all believe. They didn't all believe. They had hard hearts, but there was a remnant. And they had these things. But the Gentiles didn't. They were on the outside. So Paul is saying here, remember that you were separated from Christ and remember that you were strangers to Israel and the covenants and the promises. And then he goes on to say, having no hope and without God in the world. No hope and without God. Some of you can remember this in, in your life. Maybe you lived a period of time and, and denied God, denied the God of the Bible. Some of you have, might have a hard time remembering this because you, you believed when you were a child. But we all tend to forget. We all tend to forget. Over the last... 18 years, at one point or another, every kid of mine has struggled with the reality of death. If you have kids and they're young, just wait. If you've had kids, you know this is true. Human beings can suppress death we're very good at it. We can, we can push that down and, and, and make ourselves really busy to try to distract ourselves from the reality of it. But every once in a while, it touches down in our minds and in our hearts, whether it's through someone we know who has died or whether it's just, it hits because it's real. I've seen this in my kids A strange quietness will overtake them. Because they're thinking about it. Thinking about the reality. It, it breaks through any suppression. It just breaks through. And when that happens to any human being, you wrestle. Because it's real. And it's coming for everyone. Without the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what that means for the saints, there is no hope in the face of death. None. Not an ounce of hope. I praise God that in those moments I can bring my kids to, to that truth. That, that death is not the end. That there's hope. If I don't have that, what do we have? Right? Paul says, if we don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, we are people most to be pitied. If we're just doing this for this world now and we have no idea what's going to happen in the next, we should be pitied. Because we should be eating, drinking, 
and being merry. But the Bible has something to say about death. In fact, if you were here in our, our Genesis series, it's almost like the whole trajectory of the Bible is fighting against that hopelessness. What happens in, in Genesis when Adam and Eve sin and death enters the scene? God pronounces his judgment on Satan, the man and the woman, and then he gives hope. And he says the seed of Eve or the offspring of Eve is going to crush the head of the offspring of the serpent. And Paul elaborates on that as the Bible unfolds. And, and we know that he is going to destroy the works of the devil, First John, the works of the devil, which is death and sin. The seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, has come to defeat death. They were without hope and without God. Scott Hubbard says this. Remember, Paul tells the Ephesians that you were once separated, alienated, estranged, hopeless. Because then, and only then, will it mean something that in Christ you are reconciled, welcomed, adopted, and saved. So too with us. If we are going to love Christ much, we need to remember the depths from which he saved us. If we're going to treasure all we have in him, we need to remember who we were without him. And that's our text today. That's the thrust of it. Paul is saying you were separated and now you have been brought near. And I would just again ask you regularly remind yourself of this truth. And maybe you're not there yet. Maybe you're working through that, that truth. We all have to work through that. Is that real? Um, is there truly judgment and truly wrath? Um, and are we saved from that? Uh, but I, again, I, I say it all the time. This, this gospel doesn't make much sense without, you know, the saving of Jesus and the cross doesn't make sense without the wrath of God, um, judgment, and, and hell. All right, so now we have the great reversal. We're not going to stay there. We never stay there as Christians. We meditated on it. We, we, we thought about it. Now we're going to move on to the hope. So again, Paul is saying, just his argument here, if you're not in Christ, you have no part in, in Israel, you're not connected to the promises and the covenants, you have no hope, and you're without God. That, that's his argument. <laughs> Ephesians 2.13. But now, how many times in the Bible do we hear, but now? But now, these are some of the best words in the scriptures. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We haven't just been declared righteous, although we have, but there was a cost. The cost was the Son of God, the blood of the Son of God. But hear Paul's argument here. So now we are in Christ. We are now citizens, part of Israel. He's going to unpack that in verse 19. We now are included in the promises and the covenants. We have hope and we have God. Complete reversal of, of where we were. And if you're um, think, a thinking person, you might be asking, what do you mean we're part of Israel, Pastor? What, is, what does that mean, that we're, we're citizens of, of, of Israel? Um, well, to, to tell a little story, you, you guys have heard some of these stories before, and in, in the other business that, that I'm a part of, um, I deal with Hasidic Jews. Uh, these guys are in, in Brooklyn, and uh, they, they live together. They are, you know, these are the guys like big black hats, uh, curly, curlies. They're, they're Old Testament to a T, trying to follow the Old Testament, and um, and and just is kind of a, an offshoot of how Jews think we're dogs. They they won't eat with me because I'm a Gentile. Um, so there's a, you know, we do business together, but there's a line. Uh, they won't cross it. Uh, so so these guys. 
they, they have their feasts, Feast of Tabernacles, the Day of Atonement. And from time to time, I, I talk to them on the phone about these feasts and how the, what they're doing. Um, but as a Christian, I understand their feasts better than they do. Because all of the feasts of the Old Testament were ultimately pointing to one man, Jesus Christ, to one covenant, the new covenant. Today we're going to take the Lord's Supper, and and the Lord's Supper, in a way, are, are all of those feasts of the Old Testament being fulfilled in one sign of the new covenant, which is the Lord's Supper. There's a rich history in the Lord's Supper. But back to, to my Jewish friends. It could be said that you and I are more of a Jew than Jews today. Because everything that the Old Testament was pointing to was fulfilled in Jesus. It was pointing to Jesus. Without Jesus, that doesn't make sense. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians that without turning to Christ, when you read the Old Testament, there's a veil. You can't understand it. That's in 1 Corinthians. So what does Paul mean that we we were far off from, from the commonwealth of Israel, now we're in Israel? Well, let's go to 2 Corinthians 1.20. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. All of those Old Testament promises find their yes in Jesus. Jesus is the true Israel. He's the remnant of one. If you look at the the life of Jesus, you will see even his 40 days in the the wilderness is, is mimicking Israel's 40 years. But he passed the test. Jesus passed the test. He is the true Israel. Justin Taylor says this, Jesus is the true Israel. And the church becomes the Israel of God as it unites to true Israel. The same is true for ethnic Israel, whom God has not abandoned, but their only hope is to be united with Jesus, the ultimate suffering service. So, suffering servant, because I didn't have enough time and because I care about you and I don't want to keep you here for three hours, there was a ton of information that I could have unpacked and, and looked at true Israel versus ethnic Israel. Just know there's a distinction. Paul makes a distinction. Ethnic Israel today is a real thing. We are not ethnic Israel. But the Bible would say that we are true Israel because all of that was pointing to this. All of that was pointing to this. A little further down in in this section of Ephesians, Paul says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. So here, here's his point. You were, once were a stranger to, to Israel and the covenants. You're no longer a stranger. But you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. Next week, we're going to look at that. It's the one new man, the Jew and the Gentile coming together in the church. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. John Piper says, salvation is from the Jews. And now that Christ has come, the gospel has spilled over the banks of Israel to all the nations. And Paul is dealing with that here. So the gospel that we proclaim was originally for Israel. If you think back to to the gospels, you can maybe, this is ringing in your ears, Jesus came for the lost sheep of Israel, right? Right? He even says, don't go to the Gentiles. That happened after the cross and the resurrection. And it wasn't a second, um, it wasn't plan B. It was always God's plan. But the the early church, the first church, were were Jews. They were Jews. But we have been grafted in. In fact, Paul uses this language in Romans 11. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, he's talking to Gentiles, to us, 
were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. So the olive tree in the Old Testament often represents Israel, and he is saying, you've been grafted in. You're in. We have all those covenants, why, all the promises, all the covenants, and you might be thinking, well, then why don't we do those feasts and practice those things and obey those laws? Because it was all fulfilled in Jesus. All of it. It was all pointing to Jesus, all of it. It's not an accident that the temple of God where the Jews had to, it was the center of their worship and the religious life was destroyed after the coming of Christ. Done. It's over. Not to be rebuilt as many today believe. No more sacrifice. The last sacrifice has happened. It is Jesus Christ. By his blood, you and I, we've been brought in to this deep-rooted historical faith that we were once outside of, and now we're in. We've been grafted in. And we can read the Old Testament and look at those promises and not get confused. And maybe it was fulfilled in Christ. Maybe it was terminated because of the new covenant. But we can read it and say, those are my brothers and sisters in Christ. And we can take those promises with with context into our hearts. So I would ask you this morning, church, have you considered as a church, When you come in here on on Sunday and you're part of the life of the church, have you considered how rich and deep and rooted our heritage as Christians is? How deep the roots of the church go. They go deep all the way back into the Old Testament. God's gathered people. And then I would ask you this, and and everyone's going to be in a different place here, but in light of this truth, How should we treat the gathering of the saints and the life of the body that is the church? You know, we we live right now in a in a world that uh, is trying to erase the past. Call it cancel culture, call it whatever you will, but um, trying to detach from any history, from any tradition and just bring in something new, new ways of thinking. And sometimes that, that, that's needed. I'm not saying that new ways of thinking aren't, aren't good, but we stand, church, in such a beautiful place. Not only do we have 2,000 years of church history that, that has been beneficial to us, we've got the entire Bible that goes back all the way to Genesis. We have history. Let's connect to that history. Let's remember that history. I mean, even what we're doing right now, just to give you a little of that, it, it's to benedictions, calls to worship, the unpacking of the Word of God, giving it sense, the reading of the Word of God. This is synagogue. Uh, this is pattern after synagogue. Um, obviously, the New Testament picks up on that, and, and you'll see it in 1 Corinthians of what to do when, when we gather, but our roots go back further than Pentecost. They go back into the Old Testament. Even the temple worship, to a degree, there's traces of that that you will find in here. We're standing in thousands of years of tradition. So church, brothers and sisters, at one time, You and I were outside of all this beauty, outside of the covenants, without hope, outside of God's people. And by the blood of Christ, we've been brought near. We're going to take communion here in a minute. And this is communion is a way to remember. So it's fitting that we're taking communion today when we were talking about remembering where we were, um, it's fitting. And, and, and our text has been brought near by, by the blood of Christ. But all the promises in the Old Testament were leading up to where we find ourselves today. And I want to read here 
from Jeremiah 31 before we come up and take the cup and the bread. Jeremiah 31, I don't think I have this on the screen, so just, just listen. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Brothers and sisters, those days are here. This scripture is now. It's the new covenant. We live in the new covenant, a covenant that had been foretold and prophesied about all throughout the Bible and Israel's history, and we are in it. We have been grafted in, like Paul says, as Gentiles. There's two signs of the new covenant. The first sign is baptism by immersion. It's the entrance into the covenant. When you're baptized, you, you say, I'm dying to, to my sin, my old self. I'm rising to Christ, and I am part of this community. And the other sign is the Lord's Supper, which we're going to take right now. And that is a strengthening of grace for the believer, and we're going to take it together corporately. And it's just a reminder that we believe this, and we're communing with Christ through it. If you do not call Christ, your Lord, your King, your Savior. If you would say, I don't believe, we would ask that you pass. This isn't, there's nothing magic in the bread, in the cup. It is simply to be taken by faith, and we take it very serious. So if you are not a believer, please pass. So I would ask you at this point to, to come forward and to take the, the bread and the cup, and we're going to take some time as you get it, to, to remember as we do it. So come on forward um, and take the bread in the cup. Thanks for tuning in with us. We hope that you found this sermon edifying, encouraging, and challenging. To learn more about Vintage Faith Church, visit vintagefaithcicero.com. And of course, if you live in the area, we invite you to worship the Lord with us on Sunday mornings.